Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am a piece of trash. Look, I apologize. Uh, I am wearing a shirt. It is orange. It looks I am currently washed out by the light. I promise I am not shirtless. Shirtless with a collar. I'm naked with a collar. That would be quite the trick. Um, probably being able to pull, pulled off by someone so stingy as myself. Look, I am really struggling <clears throat> this month. So the Dickinson Darkly series probably not going to happen this month. Probably not going to kick off this month. And, you know, it's one of the sort of um, one of the downsides of doing a series like that is going to be that we're going to miss a lot of the good ones for a while. And I say good ones because there are definitely um, quality, qualitative differences. Whenever you're reading a, a writer who has 1,775 poems. But Emily Dickinson took a little while to really get that Hemi engine brain of hers that bah, 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 revved up um, in order to write some of the better ones, some of the stronger pieces that she wrote. So once we do start that series, it's going to be waving bye-bye to some of my favorite poems for a while. Uh, but look, we're going to get into things here in just a second. Uh, first off, I am only 49 subscribers away now from 1,000 subscribers on my personal channel, uh, a link to which can be found in the description below if you want to if you want to be somebody to me. Go over there and subscribe there. And thank you to everyone in the last couple of days who has done that on your own. Um, real quick. Before we get started to literature is the only thing I talk about on this channel. So if you find yourself here by chance, but not design, all I do here is talk about poetry, talk about short stories, do novel read alongs. And if you want to help me out here on this channel, if you hit that like button, it tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. Now, here is one of my favorite poems from Emily Dickinson. And I want to give a little bit of a preface to this. I, I don't think. Now, I think I've done several discussions about I'm nobody, who are you on this channel? So maybe one of those other ones is this exact topic. But I don't think so. I think this is the first time I have ever conceptualized this poem in this way. So that's one of the amazing things about poetry is that you bring so much of yourself into it. And it's so brief to read that every time you come to a poem, every time you find a poem, you're a different person. So that poem itself is a different poem. Now, sometimes if, if, you, if you take a poem seriously enough if a poem means enough to you, that other meaning is going to be in the back of your brain. You'll still remember how it was that you had interpreted said poem, what that poem meant to you when you found it, and probably when you, share, when you enjoyed that poem for the first little while, it was the same interpretation for you. So... Um, I died for beauty, but was scarce suggested in the tomb when one who died for truth was laying in an adjoining room. If that poem, again by Emily Dickinson, had meant so much to you that you really embellished truth and beauty with meanings to you, you read that poem and read that poem and read that poem and digested it, worked it over. The next time you found that poem, you'd be able to remember what truth and beauty were for you. Now, later in life, truth and beauty might be completely different things to you. So, you find that poem, and suddenly that poem is two poems. You have the old one still, what it did mean to you. But now you have this new one, too. So, I want to get into this poem here. I'm nobody, who are you? It reads as such, I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us, don't tell, 
They'd advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell one's name the live-long June to an admiring bog. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody, too? This is a poem I've probably read 400 times, 500 times. It's a very important poem to me. It's a poem that means a lot to me. It's a poem that I've spent a lot of time with. I don't know that I've ever conceived it this way. We're going to go over something real quick that is going to speak to this poem. It's a, uh, it's a definition. It's a definition I, I got from the Encyclopedia Britannica, I believe is where I <clears throat> copy and pasted this from. <clears throat> Pardon me. In media res. Latin. In the midst of things. The practice of beginning an epic or other narrative by plunging into a crucial situation that is part of a related chain of events. The situation is an extension of previous events and will be developed in later action. The narrative then goes directly forward. An exposition of earlier events is supplied by flashbacks. The principle of in media res is based on the practice of Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad, for example, begins dramatically with the quarrel between Achilles and Agamemnon during the Trojan War. In his Ars Poetica, the Latin poet and critic Horace pointed out the immediate interest created by this opening in contrast to beginning the story ab ovo from the egg i.e. from the birthplace of Achilles, in which the story's earliest chronological point. Though its roots are in ancient epic poems, in media res can be found today across numerous fiction and non-fiction narrative forms. The art of in media res grants your audience immediate attention, grants your audience an immediate place in this world. I'm nobody. Who are you? Why do I bring up in media res with this? To suggest that this poem is in media res, to suggest that this poem is in the middle of things, is to suggest, as all literature does, as all paintings do, as all photography does, the beginning of this is in the middle of something. Do you see now? Our speaker is approaching you. Our speaker is saying, I'm nobody. Who are you? Easy to get lost on the page, but very clearly. This poem starts, I'm nobody, who are you? It's with a handshake. An introduction, I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us, don't tell, they'd advertise, you know? How dreary to be somebody. How public like a frog. To tell one's name the live long June to an admiring bog. But... Who are you? I'm nobody. Hi, my name is Jika Jika Nobody. That's me. So here we have this speaker. So if we allow ourselves this interpretation of the poem, all of a sudden, the speaker goes from quirky and perhaps self-deprecating to possibly, probably, almost definitely so innocent as to not understand the irony of what they're doing, introducing yourself to someone, telling them your name, while you were saying how dreary it would be to be somebody, is that then? So, okay, we have this admission 
in the introduction, I'm nobody. I'm nothing. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then we get this line. Then there's a pair of us ended in an exclam exclamation point. This nobody is so desperately searching for another nobody with whom to be nobody. But then pulls themselves back. Don't tell. They'd advertise, you know. And then, if they advertise, if they advertise that there's a couple of nobodies here, how dreary it would be to be somebody. Because if people know about us, we go from being nobody to having to be somebody. And that's public. Very public. Very out there. Like a frog. The way a frog just announces itself. Ribbit. Ribbit. Telling one's name the live long June to an admiring bog. Here we have this speaker proclaiming the sort of benefits of being a nobody, the moral superiority of being the nobody. But his projection. Because this nobody is exa is acting exactly how the evil somebody would act. I'm nobody. Who are you? Tell one's name the live long June. Are you nobody too? Which is an admiring bog. To have that pair of us, the admiring bog. How should we take this poem? Should we take this poem that way? Or should we read it more surface level? Is this a speaker speaking to his or herself? If this is the speaker's consciousness speaking to the speaker's subconscious, should we take it that way? If we take it that way, a conversation with the self perhaps it is a little more quirky versus if the nobody in question is a somebody else and the you in question is a, well, maybe a you, then the speaker suddenly becomes very innocent, sort of innocent to a fault as to not see the irony in what it is that the speaker is talking about. Not to see that what he or she is doing here is exactly the type of thing that he or she is preaching against. Introducing themselves. Just that opening line, the in media res of I'm nobody, who are you? How is this approach made? The assumption from the speaker is that the approached someone, the you in question, is as well a nobody. Which kind of suggests that this occurrence is happening between two solitary individuals someplace strange, right? Someplace neither of them really belongs. I don't know that I have ever fully thought about the fact that, yes, there is a sometime before. Here. I'm nobody. Who are you? That is not the cold start. That's happening in the middle of someone else's life. That is all I have for this poetry discussion. I'm Nobody Who Are You by Emily Dickinson. If you find yourself here by chance but not design, consider hitting the subscribe button in order to stick around for more if 
you want to help me out with what I'm doing here, hitting the like button tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And, of course, 49 subscribers away now from 1,000 on my personal channel where I talk about philosophy, I talk about movies, I talk about all sorts of other things, not literature related. 1,000 subscribers. I'm just 49 short of being somebody and telling my name, the live long June, to an admiring bog. Go over there, subscribe to me there as well. And I hope, look, it's National Poetry Month. Poetry discussions every day of the month. And I hope to have you back for the next one.